We'll come to order. This is the uh, the place and almost time-ish for, uh, for the meeting to come to order for the uh, Appropriations <coughs> Subcommittee on Homeland Security. Today's uh, hearing is uh, the fiscal year 2025 budget for the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement budget. Um, I uh, don't have an opening statement, which I'm sure nobody will miss today either. And so with that, I will recognize our ranking member, Mr. Quayer, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, uh, and I also want to, uh, of course, say welcome uh, to our uh, acting director for U.S. Uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, uh, commonly known as ICE. And, and thank you for all the years of service that you provided. And, and I want to thank your men and women that work for ICE. Um, many years of public service and your willingness to lead this multifaceted uh, organization. As you know, this uh, federal agency is charged with the enforcement of violation of customs and immigration laws. Um, and, and again, but it does a lot more. A lot of people think it's just immigration, but it's a lot more. You also combat cartels and other transnational criminal organizations, illicit drug trafficking, including fentanyl, human trafficking, smuggling networks, and of course, violation of trade and intellectual property laws that seek to undermine our economic uh, security. Look forward to discussing uh, with you uh, the President FY 2025 budget request and how this proposal will better enable ICE to fulfill its critical national security mission and keep our community safe. In particular, I'm interested in how the investments in homeland security investigations we secured in this FY uh, 24 and uh, what some of the proposed investments for fiscal year 2025 will increase the government-wide efforts to combat opioid et uh, epidemic, and of course, that's impacting our community, small and large communities. Uh, we know what's happened with uh, the deaths, especially uh, the ones from fentanyl, uh, and uh, we want to make sure that we continue fighting the criminal organizations and whatever y'all can do at the southern border and other places also. Uh, also, uh, as I mentioned to the Secretary last week, uh, we're pleased that uh, we're able to get you resources to increase your detention capacity and maintain important facility oversight to maintain, uh, to better align with what uh, you're seeing along the border. Uh, we also, um, um, you know, hopefully if we have a border supplemental, uh, uh, you know, there are some parts out there, but certainly want to talk to you about that and, and also talk about expedited removal and what legal authorities you may need for those in the alternatives uh, to detention to ensure the maximum use to get our uh, non-detained dockets to more manageable uh, levels. Um, again, uh, there is no shortage of issues that face ICE. Uh, we certainly know that even working with the immigration judges, we need more of your personnel there, but we'll save that for the questions. But I want to say thank you, and to the men and women for ICE, thank you so much for the service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Quayer. And keeping with that theme, you are recognized for the first questioning. Uh, oh, about a five minute, uh, you know. <laughs> the opening statement from uh, who was it yesterday? Was it Ohio? Pekoski, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I keep trying, it doesn't work. I don't know who these people on this DS with me are, but uh, hey, listen, if you'd like to do an opening statement, you are by all means welcome to do so now. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, Chair. I appreciate it. And uh, so I don't know if I would like to, but I will. So uh, good afternoon. I appreciate you having me, and it's my honor to serve the people of ICE and of Homeland Security. So, um, Chairman Amade, Ranking Member Cuellar, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'm proud to lead the most versatile and agile agency in the Department of Homeland Security, although I'm, I may be biased. Our operators, uh, operations evolve as new threats arise, and at every turn, our workforce adapts to meet those challenges. More than 20,000 ICE personnel work tirelessly to protect national security and promote public safety, including thousands of officers and special agents who put their lives on the line every single day to keep us all safe. And I know that because I was one of them. My highest priority is ensuring the ICE workforce has the resources they need to fulfill their obligations to the American people. I want to thank you for your work on Fiscal Year 24 Consolidated Appropriations Act. Truly thank you. 
and provide the ICE workforce critical resources, and I'm proud to present the FY25 budget proposal. The mission of ICE Enforcement and Removal Operations, or ERO as it's known, is to protect the homeland through the arrest, detention, and removal of non-citizens who undermine the safety of U.S. communities and the integrity of the U.S. immigration system. While ERO's immigration enforcement authorities focus in the interior of the United States, encounters at the southwest border drive our operations and our resource needs, as you are so acutely aware. While a non-citizen encountered at the border may be in CBP custody for 72 hours approximately, they may remain in ERO's, on ERO's dockets for years until provided immigration relief or removal. In addition, ERO continues to provide personnel, logistical support, and alternatives to detention technology to help manage irregular migration at the southwest border. To enforce immigration laws in the interior, ERO officers identify and arrest criminal non-citizens, often with the help from partner law enforcement agencies, and that's vital. ERO officers also plan and execute small and large-scale operations to arrest at-large criminal non-citizens who threaten the safety of our families, friends, and neighbors. In February and March, ERO officers arrested 491 non-citizens convicted of serious crimes during two nationwide operations. And I did some press conferences for these. These individuals were convicted of an array of offenses, inclu including drug trafficking, sexual assault, and crimes exploiting children. These operations were, were a tremendous success, but are only a small part of the work ERO officers do every day to keep our communities safe. The bottom line is we have to keep dangerous non-citizens, including known or suspected terrorists and gang members off our streets. The ability, the agency's ability to remove individuals to their home countries and detain those who require detention or pose public safety threats is directly dependent on, the, on ERO resources. But, we have other obligations too. Homeland Security Investigations, or HSI, because of its unique authorities and footprint, is the federal law enforcement agency best positioned to investigate and dismantle transnational criminal organizations. HSI has the unique legal authority to conduct federal criminal investigations into illegal cross-border movement of people, goods, money, technology, and other contraband. HSI is one of the largest, has one of the largest international footprints in U.S. law enforcement, operating in 55 countries around the world. HSI is, is on the front lines of the war against fentanyl and works close, closely with federal, state, local, and tribal law enforcement partners at home and abroad to fight this horrible opioid epidemic. HSI also combats child exploitation all over the world, takes down polycrime transnational criminal organizations, as well as bringing down cyber criminals, human traffickers, and people who commit customs or financial fraud. HSI has a huge and transnationally focused mission set, but it also has a tremendously talented workforce that includes some of the world's best criminal analysts, special agents, and subject matter experts. The funding request in FY25 budget supports this tremendous workforce and ensures we are continuing to take the fight to those who profit from exploiting our trade and financial systems. As global leaders in the fight against transnational criminal organizations, the opioid crisis, and child exploitation, we just can't afford to fail. Failure would let down the American people who depend on us to keep them safe and preserve the integrity of our nation's laws. Ensuring we can fully execute the responsibilities con Congress has given us requires appropriate resources, so I respectfully submit ICE's fiscal year 2025 budget request for your consideration. Again, I'd like to thank you for allowing me this time to speak with you today. I am truly humbled and honored to re represent the men and women of ICE and look forward to answering your questions and providing you the information you need. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director. Uh, Mr. Quayer, would it be okay if I called on you now for your questions or? Have I, have I disrespected anybody else that was set to testify in the hearing? I will ask the uh, gentlewoman from Ohio if she's okay, I'm sure. <laughs> no, no, it's a, yeah, they, they, that's an inside job. <laughs> now that we're off to this friendly start, I'd like to recognize the ranking member from the Lone Star State, Mr. Cuero, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you again so much. Uh, Mr. Director, um, as you know, the non-detained docket is upward to $7 million individuals projected to grow to uh, 8 million by the end of the fiscal year. 
Um, last week when we were talking to the secretary, he said that one of the major provisions of the Senate bipartisan legislation would have been incredible uh, impactful were if we would apply an expedited removal proceedings to individuals outside of immigration detention, we would have been able to uh, reduce a seven plus year asylum process to maybe 90 days. So my question is, um, is it possible that ICE could consider detain, uh, you know, wh whose detain alternatives to detention be considered uh, for expedited removal? Let's say, for example, uh, programs like FIRM or something like that could have, that could be applied broadly. We're just trying to think outside the box within the legal authorities. And if that's an option, what would the cost be? Thank you, sir. Yes. Um, we're looking outside the box within, within ICE and the Department of Homeland Security to try to figure out how we can push down this number and deal with the, uh, the non-detained numbers. Uh, obviously, we have uh, several population groups within our detained, non-detained population. So we have our detained population, which obviously those are you know, being detained in a facility. And then we have the non-detained, and that you know, has the people who are just, you know, report, have to report at some point, and also we have uh, an ATT population in there. So the ATD population is part of that non-detained. We do have, we have been working, and the firm is what, uh, one part of that is the family expedited removal uh, process, uh, but it's a very small subset. And what that does is it, it, it's been helpful in helping remove uh, families. So we're, we're, you know, getting some help in uh, removing the family units, which are notoriously difficult to do. It's very complex. We want to make sure we do it properly and judiciously in the right way to make sure we protect all those individuals' rights. Uh, but moving that into a larger subset of individuals com becomes not just more expensive, which it would be. However, it will it will delay the immigration processes for the rest of the individuals. So the quickest way to, to expedite, expeditiously remove someone is through the detained docket, because obviously they're there, they're very easily to get to, you can do all the processes and procedures. Can I interrupt? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but the Senate provisions would apply that to non-detained dockets, and they said they could probably reduce it from 70-year wait to a 90-day wait. So you're saying it you need resources to do that? Or, I mean, if the Senate deal would have passed, then you would have been applying that, correct? Yes, absolutely. If the Senate deal would have passed, it would have given us some additional resources. In addition to resources, it would have given us uh, flexibility in some of the, in the rules or procedures and policies. So, so my question again, sir, is so can you consider somebody in a monitoring system or a check-in to be part of the detained population? Or do they have to be physically inside of a four- wall place to be part of the detained population you must be detained the the a, uh, adt are considered the non-detained population so but they could we could use some uh, efforts such as firm to apply some expedited removal but they wouldn't be considered part of the detained population oh, okay i i was thought the secretary was going another direction but we can follow up what about the uh, notice to appear appointment backlog? Uh, the last year's prior acting director indicated some locations like New York were backed up to 2033. Uh, where are we today and what are the changes to expedite caseload? Yes, yeah, so currently uh, New York, there's two offices in New York that are backed up and actually I, I believe it's 2034, my, ro my most recent date on that. The top 10 offices are two in New York we have uh, Florida, Illinois, uh, Chicago, Illinois, Dallas, Texas, uh, New Jersey, um, then San Antonio, Texas, Louisville, Kentucky, Baltimore, Maryland, and Florida in that order from the longest wait times. Uh, could you provide us a copy of that? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, because I know I got that from last year. I know New York was number one, then it was Miami, and it was like 10 years and nine years. It was just a crazy amount of time. Uh, so what do we do to move the needle? So we're working several things to move the needle. So we're trying to work some technological solutions so we can allow these individuals. So the non-citizen portal, which has recently been rolled out where non-citizens can check in more easily. So take the load off some of the field offices. We are trying to, uh, allow some other technical capabilities to come into play and it just takes some time to do so. We're also doing, uh, you know, you know, surging some resources there. But at the end of the day, sir, you know, we have 
give or take uh, seven million, just over seven million in the non-detained, and uh, the numbers are continuing. So it's we only have about 1,100 officers that handle that non-detained, about 4,500 officers in total. And if we move officers off of other, like fugitive operations or detained, then other things will suffer as well in addition to that non-detained process. So it sounds like the backlog is going to remain. It's going to remain for the time being, yes. Uh, uh, to finish this, uh, uh, we added in the FY24 $10 million for additional expedited removal of assistance. Hopefully that can help you process and hopefully you can hire those people quickly. Yes, absolutely. And we are in the process of hiring those individuals and working as quickly as possible to get those hired. And some of that money, if we cannot get those people hired by the end of the year, which is a process they have to get cleared, that money will be used to be, uh, as a backfill for some other monies within that program that we cannot do. Okay. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Mr. Cuellar. Um, Next, uh, I'd like to recognize the ranking member of the House Committee on Appropriations, the gentlelady from Connecticut. The floor is yours. Thank you, and, and I, let me offer my congratulations to you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for taking up the uh, reins of this, uh, this subcommittee. Delightful to work with you. Thank you, I think. Yes, right. Well, that's right. And re remind me, I have a, 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 an invitation uh, to you from the Sons and Daughters of Italy uh, in May, want to honor you, so I can't forget. I saw, rem just reminded myself. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you so much for, 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 for being here. Yesterday at the CJS hearing, Commerce Justice Science uh, hearing, I asked Attorney General Garland about what I believe is a serious blind spot and a lack of resources for the investigation and prosecution of violations of U.S. trade law. And he agreed that fraudulent trade goods pose a serious risk to our economy. When fraudulent goods enter the country, it hurts consumers, our trading partners, our domestic manufacturers, and it hurts above all U.S. workers. He mentioned the Trade Fraud Task Force. And that, if I may paraphrase, the difficulty in identifying the fraudulent goods as they come in which, of course, is a homeland security issue. And I don't think many people know this, but HSI plays a huge role in this, in this space. Can you elaborate on what is um, in your 2025 request uh, includes resources to increase your customs and trade investigations and referrals uh, to DOJ for prosecution? Um, and are you working with the DOJ on their trade of a fraud task force? Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon and pleasure to meet you. You too. Uh, yes, we are. The simple answer is yes, we You're are. working We're, with DOJ. We are. We're on those mm -hmm. task forces and we work with them collab co collaboratively to attack mm -hmm. this. As you, and you're rightly, you, as you rightly say, uh, HSI is involved with this effort uh, mm -hmm. very robustly. Uh, we trace uh, our investigative authorities back through U.S. Customs, which started in 1789, mm -hmm. and trade enforcement is, is one of our primary efforts. Mm -hmm. In addition to the task force that is a DOJ task force, we also have an internal DHS task force between ICE and CBP, or, but primarily HSI and Office of Field Operations and some others within CBP. That's the Trade Enforcement Coordination Center, mm -hmm. and we also attack it internally through DHS. So we're robustly working with DOJ to work on any kind of criminality and, and investigations there. We're also working within DHS. Mm -hmm. And those two entities and those two efforts are aligned as well. What's the process? How do you move to, you know, to identify a fraud and fraudulent goods coming in? Well, how much time do you have, Matt? Well, not a lot. <laughs> not a lot. And I have another question, but let, I'll just... Uh, well, it's... it's yeah. It's, it's, it's good police work and, and good gumshoe investigation. So uh, the, our partners at CBP are highly trained in identifying where there's fraudulent merchandise, counterfeit, you name it. Mm -hmm. And then where, where they see an anomaly, they'll, uh, they'll try and identify what it is. And if they, if they uh, identify something that truly looks like it is an anomaly and, some, and requires further investigation, then they call in HSI and we'll help them and we'll take that uh, investigation further and it'll go either criminal or administrative depending on the nature of the violation. Uh, but as you rightly say, it is not an easy thing. These things are secreted and these criminal organizations or individuals are doing everything they can to smuggle them in and it, it could 
It could be any number of things that they're doing, and mm -hmm. it's in their best interest to make it as hard as possible for our abilities to detect. Mm -hmm. uh, have, have you put in a substantial amount for resources in the budget for this area? We have put some, there's some uh, money in the budget for this, and we have uh, resources going to support domestic operations, which is where this would fall, a mm -hmm. substantial amount in the 25 budget. And we also work you know, collaboratively with CBP on all this. I'm going to try for another question before they cut me off here. Okay, um, gotcha. 2019, since that time, a substantial increase in child labor viola viola violations. Uh, many of these kids come from vulnerable backgrounds. They work long hours for little to no pay, frequently abused and deprived of any chance to play or go to school. I am a proud sponsor of the Children Harmed in Life-Threatening or Dangerous Child Labor Act, which would strengthen our federal child labor laws and hold companies that exploit the labor of children accountable. Um, HSI also plays a key role here by combating the illegal importation of goods purchased through illegal labor practices, including forced labor or child labor. How does your budget request propose to continue or bolster efforts to look to our borders and beyond to investigate and rescue victims of child labor practices amidst its invest it, it, amidst investigating many types of illegal labor practices, can you speak to how HSI is addressing the issue of illegal child labor specifically? Yes, certainly, ma'am. So um, HSI has been doing this and, and concentrates heavily here. We have asked for uh, just over $10 million, almost $11 million for the Center to Counter Human Trafficking, mm -hmm. which supports all of these efforts from a DHS-wide center, and we're the executive agent and and lead that effort there. Also, there's different uh, additional budget monies in there to pull over from monies from the blue campaign, which is related to this to combat it. Um, we also have the Uyghur Force Labor Prevention Act that provides that pro providing uh, positions and monies to attack these efforts. In addition to those efforts, we also have, through, in addition to the CCHT, we have within HSI our, our uh, Transnational Criminal Investigative Division and we go after uh, these, uh, this, this criminality in conjunction with Department of Labor and Department of Justice and Health and Human Services. So we have to do this, we have to do this together because none of us have all of the pieces. And we also have to work with our state and local counterparts because very often where these children are employed and working, it's not necessarily transparent that there's a victimization going on and uh, sometimes they're hidden in plain sight. So we have to work very, very proactively and jointly with our state, local, federal partners. I'd love to follow up with you because I think some of these bad actors who are doing this, we have to figure out how they can be stopped. What are the kinds of action that we can take against uh, these businesses um, uh, that, that are doing this? And obviously that, uh, that includes yourself and DOJ and Department of Labor. So I would love to continue this conversation offline. So thank you very much. And uh, um, thank you for your gracious yeah. indulgence. Appreciate it, thanks. Uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Rutherford, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Director. Thank you very much uh, for your service. Thank you to your staff as well. Um, I really appreciate you guys are so forthcoming with uh, answers and information, uh, even in preparation for this meeting. So th thank you very much for that. Uh, I, I want to go back a minute to talk about the non-detained docket and the detained docket, actually, because... It, when when people look at the um, the EROs and who's being deported, you know we had last year ICE deported 142,580. Now that I know from having spoken with you that that there are there are some issues that stop us from and make those deportations difficult. That's why when when Mr. Cuellar was, was talking earlier about some of these deport, deportations and how we can expedite that. Can you talk just for a minute and can you give us a list of the countries that uh, give you a hard time or just completely resist taking these uh, folks back? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the question. Um, it is a complex procedure. So uh, not only is, are these individuals encountered in, you know, primarily by CBP, uh, then they're turned over to, to ICE and we have them through the life cycle of the, of the civil immigration uh, procedures. Um, but if they're a threat to national security or public safety, 
they're going to be detained. Sure. Um, and then otherwise, they would move on to the non-detained status. And depending on uh, where we're at with uh, our threat vector, they'll potentially have some uh, alternatives to detention. So they won't be detained, but they'll be there, a subset of the non-detained. But it is not easy sometimes to um, remove these individuals, as you might imagine. You just can't turn them over. Right. You're going to have to work. So, so how, much, how much help do you get, Director, in in pressuring through the State Department or, or the, the President to get these people to take their own people back? How, how much help do we get there? And but, while you're thinking about it, can you actually give me a list of those countries that are most difficult to deal with? Oh, certainly, yes. Yeah. So uh, I'll start with the second part first. Um, um, we got Bhutan, top of the list there, uh, Cambodia. Uh, they've been challenging um, the People's Republic of China, although uh, we've had some recent um, cautiously optimistic pro uh, progress with, with uh, the Chinese. So I want to I wanna say that it's okay. moving in the right direction there. Uh, Can you just provide us that list? Yes, thank, I'd be happy thank you. to. Thank you. And the, and the other part? And the other part is we're working collaboratively with the Department of Homeland Security writ large and the State Department. And I must say that uh, throughout the Department of Homeland Security and the State Department, they're very forward-leaning in trying to rectify any of these recalcitrant cr countries, but there are a lot of geopolitical uh, issues that, involve, that, that do not revol revolve around the immigration and removal, and it's, it's not an easy issue for them either. All right, and in, in kind of following up on that, Knowing that we have 1.2 million who already have their removal orders issued, and they are all they're in every community in America. I know many law enforcement agencies like mine have a 287G program, which allows them to work through ICE to identify these folks when they're incarcerated, and then we expedite getting them out. Again, going back to Mr. Quayar's point about ex expediting. We, we can expedite that, and ICE simply needs to come and pick them up. Uh, we put detainers on them, and they come and pick them up, and then they deport them. Uh, can, so Tay uh, Johnson uh, said, you know, it's the best thing since sliced bread, this program. Uh, I tried to ask uh, Secretary Mayorkas if, if he would make a commitment to expanding this program that's better than sliced bread. Couldn't get an answer. Can can you tell me what you think about the 287G program, and should we be looking at expansion? Well, sir, I I, I must say I, I'm not as articulate or as funny as, as Mr. Johnson, so uh, I do miss him. Uh, however, uh, I, in my experience, a well-run and properly overseen 287G program is is useful. It helps us partner with state and local law enforcement. It's one tool in a large tool bag that we have. Uh, but I must say, I like every opportunity to partner with state and local law enforcement, and any chance I can do it, I will. Thank you. And I see, Mr. Chairman, my time is uh, burned up, so I'll yield back. Thank you, sir. Um, the floor, uh, the floor now goes to yeah, to uh, the representative from Illinois, Thank you. Ms. Underwood. Thank Please you, Mr. Proceed. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, Acting Director Lake. Le Lech Leitner. Did I say it right? Lech Leitner? That's close. Lech Leitner. Le Leitner. I'm sorry. That's fine. Uh, it's so good to see you today. Good to ICE see you. ICE plays a critical role in enforcing our nation's immigration laws, and the work done at ICE is important and should align with American values as well as our security priorities. ICE's Health Service Corps is tasked with providing direct and indirect health care services to detain non-citizens in ICE custody. This may include anything from the simple, like administration of a flu shot, to the complex, like pregnancy and delivery. As you know, ICE has a legal and moral responsibility to ensure any health services it provides to those in custody meet some baseline standards. And when receiving those services, the patient's national identity, race, gender, social economic status, or ability to communicate in English should never determine whether they receive quality care. So I was concerned to see earlier this year, ICE has failed to meet basic standards when delivering health services. According to a report issued this year by the Department of Homeland Security's Inspector General, ICE failed to follow some of its own policies between 2019 and 2021 when authorizing medical surgeries for detained non-citizens. This failure resulted in nearly one-third of medical procedures performed on immigrants in ICE custody being improperly authorized. 
According to the OIG's report, there were at least two women given hysterectomies when there was no documentation to support that this surgery was medically necessary. Director Lech, Lech Leitner. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> hysterectomies are irreversible. Once it's done, a woman cannot have children. It's a surgery that shapes her life, and it should not be performed without her consent and proof of medical necessity. I do understand that ICE has accepted the findings of the OIG report, and that's an important start. However, today I'd like to hear more about the specific changes that are being implemented now in order to improve the administration of health services to migrants in ICE custody in response to this report. Yes, thank you, ma'am. Yes, I, when I became aware of that, uh, it, it's unacceptable. It's unacceptable that we're not providing the utmost health care for those that are in our charge and, and we're responsible for. So, uh, and we as ICE, we're not happy to see that at all from the standpoint of the leadership. Uh, so, you know, we, and we concurred with those responses and we're working diligently to address them. So it is of our, you know, primary effort to make sure those in our charge are treated, treated humanely and we are efficiently, you know, taking care of their medical situation as appropriate as possible. I must say our health corps is, is very good and we're gonna ensure that we're in compliance with all the policies and procedures and, and move, moving forward, we're gonna ensure this never happens again. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't need to tell you the long and troubled history of forced sterilization in this country, especially on women of color, and hysterectomy should never be performed without fully informed consent. What is ICE doing to explicitly ensure that no woman in custody undergoes a hysterectomy without consent and medical need again? And does the agency have a plan to revisit gaps in its policies specifically concerning reproductive health care? Yes, we are revisiting all of those and we're working with the Department of Homeland Security Chief Medical Officer's Office to okay. look at it all and make sure that we do not repeat any of these problems. Excellent. And the, well, the CMO, is it's in partnership or do you, because it, it, ICE Health Corps does not report to the CMO's office. No, it's in partnership. Okay. okay. Uh, what about maternal health care? Can you share an update on the work ICE is doing to keep pregnant women in custody and their babies safe and healthy? Yes, uh, it's, 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 it's similar. We're making sure that we ensure that mothers and, you know, either pregnant or with recent ch uh, children are provoted, uh, provided the most utmost health care and that they're, they're properly taken care of in the, in the conditions that are appropriate for them and the facilities. In policies and in practice. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I hope that we can continue to stay engaged on this issue and ensure that ICE is treating it as a priority. Many of us who are lucky enough to be born in the United States may never fully understand the journey that some new Americans have taken to get here and the encounters that immigrants have with ICE shape America's global image and communities across the world in immeasurable ways. We have a responsibility to uphold our values as Americans in every single one. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, ma'am. Gentleman from Washington, Mr. Newhouse, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, acting Director, I'm going to try to like Leitner, like Lech Leitner. Sorry about that. That was perfect, second Lech, time. Lech, second time. <clears throat> well, thanks for being with us, sir. And I would also like to, through you, extend my thanks to the agents and officers and analysts, attorney, everybody that works under you for the hard work that they do to mitigate transnational threats. Um, keep our community safe and, and appreciate the, the hard you. work. So <clears throat> on the subject of detention beds, the fiscal year 25 budget uh, request includes 34,000 detention beds. Um, that's a level uh, to the detention capacity provided in fiscal years 21 uh, through 23, but a drop from last year's enacted level of 41,500. So uh, I see that you're an experienced law enforcement officer. You have a long career in that. What, what, in your opinion, is the appropriate level of detention beds? Thank you. Good question. Uh, the, the appropriate level does fluctuate. We're kind of div, uh, driven by demand at the, at the border, and then that intake will, will drive our numbers. Uh, you're correct for fiscal year uh, 24, which we're currently in. Uh, we have 41.5, uh, but that was recently enacted. When we were building the budget uh, request for fiscal year 25, uh, we were operating under a continuing resolution from 23, which is at 25. So we actually went up nine. I know this is a little convoluted, and I, I didn't like the way this was done, but we, we don't get to make the rules. Uh, it went up 9,000 from 23 to 25. But luckily, we were taken care of in a meaningful way for the fiscal year 24 that hit in March at 41.5. Uh, 
However, saying that, we have a contingency fund in, um, for the Department of Homeland Security that allows me instant access. I've been assured that. It's not the design I would want. I've been assured, though, that I have access to monies if needed to plus up those bed numbers to a, to a level where it's required. Currently, we're at right around 35,000 is where we're sitting right now, but that has been higher. It only recently was reduced, and we're you know, trying to get ready for some spring-summer flows. Uh, and you know, we have to be flexible to be able to do that. But I'm assured that that 34 number plus the contingency fund will allow us the you know the ability to operate in 25. So somewhere in the 40,000 range, probably. Currently, although uh, given some of the flows that were occurring last year, honestly, I would like to see the number closer to 50, okay. as the secretary had mentioned. But um, you know we have a top line within the Department of Homeland Security, and we have to you know work within our budget. Uh, and he said it better than I, but, uh, you know, I, I believe that we'll have the resources required to, to use detention as necessary. So the, the non-detained docket has more than doubled under this administration to include 7.1 million migrants. This not only includes the 1.3 million that have final orders of removal, but at least 617,000 illegal immigrants with criminal convictions or pending criminal charges who essentially are out on American streets right now, free if they would like to reoffend. How does uh, ICE prioritize migrants for the detained docket versus the non-detained docket, especially considering some of the recent news stories that we've heard of heinous crimes being committed uh, by those who are here illegally? Yes, so we, we do, we prioritize both, we have to, um, but we're driven by flows that come off the border. So over the last, some, quite, a, some uh, quite a bit of time. We've had uh, support going down to CBP on the southern border, so we've had ERO and HSI personnel, but in, in this instance, it's important to focus on ERO, that are assisting because of the border management and making sure we decompress areas and we're being pulled. So it's pulling us away from our interior core line of business. So where we would normally have fugitive ops teams going out to try and pick up some of these individuals who are on a non-detained docket and amenable, uh, we have to make decisions and move people around where it's the, it's the biggest pain point at a given period of time. So our, although we are not purely at the border, we're driven by some of those flows at the border and we have to, have to help CBP. So that's part of this. The other part of this- So, so you're saying it, as the flow increases, the bar essentially lowers? Not the bar lowers, but as the flow increases, <laughs> our personnel get pulled. So we're getting pulled to assist and we just don't have as many personnel to go out to pick up at-large individuals. Also, uh, in non-cooperative jurisdictions, very often we do not have uh, the, the, the necessary support from state, state and locals, where it makes it even more difficult for us to, to locate and apprehend these individuals. So it takes a lot longer. It's much easier to remove someone who's in detention where you know where they're at and you have all that information and it's much more orderly. Where you have someone in, in the community uh, depending on the circumstances, it's very complex, it's much more dangerous, and it takes much, much longer. I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you, you for your, your responses. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Yield back. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Maryland, despite our, our discussion off the record where I said I wasn't going to call on you, and you said, well, that's okay because I'm going to talk anyhow. We'd like your comments on the record then. You're recognized. The floor is yours. Well, I want to thank the chair very much for that consideration. Uh, uh, hi, thank you very much for, uh, for appearing before the, uh, before the subcommittee and for, for doing an important job. Uh, first question I'm going to ask you is about the 287G program, uh, because the secretary somehow didn't know whether or not there are more or less, you know, uh, local jurisdictions uh, who, who uh, are part of the 287. He didn't know whether there's a trend in, in decreasing or increasing. Maybe you know. I mean, I thought the secretary should know that, but maybe you know. What's, what's the trend in 287G cooperation? Well, good afternoon. I th you know, thank you for having me. Uh, it's been under review and on hold since early 21, so there's been no, jur no, no new agreements since the end of 20. Right. How, how, many, have, uh, how many have been ended since then? Uh, the most recent, off I, take that, I have to take that as a get back to see how many have ended okay. in those three years, but the latest ending was at the end of 20, end of 23, I believe. Right. So, so when, when, the, when the secretary came in 22. and said he's doing everything he can to uh, keep our communities safe, um, I take it that it was this administration that basically ended the program. It's been, on, new, new. It's been on hold since. It's been on hold since. So, so 
I don't understand. Can you explain to me how that protects communities by suspending new uh, agreements under the 287G? Uh, no, sir. I okay. Was, I didn't think you could because it's intuitively obvious to anybody who thinks about it that obviously if you care about protecting communities, 287G is a valuable tool, and this administration doesn't want to use a valuable tool. Okay. I get it. I think the secretary should have known that, but, uh, but yeah, look, I, I don't get it. Anyway, in your, the ERO, um, part of the, I had a question because it, sa it said in your testimony here that commercial and charter flight services continue to increase. Now, why is that? My impression was that we are not deporting as many people. Well, we deport, we might, it's about the same number, I guess. So uh, are these the flights that transport people into the interior from the border? No, sir. No, oh, these are uh, uh, decompression flights moving people from uh, one part of the border to another. These are not interior flights. We've, we haven't ever re removed anyone to the interior. Okay, so that's another agency does, another branch of the agency does that. I'm not aware. No, Who, I'm who's not aware. chartering the midnight flights? That's all I want to know. It's not us. Okay, good, good, because, because we can't even get answers oh. about, you know, when these midnight flights arrive, what, you know, notification that they're sending them into your district, things like this that you, a member of Congress probably ought to know. Uh, so you're decompressing to other detention facilities, to other processing facilities when you're, you know, when we were down at uh, uh, Del Rio, I mean, we were there a couple weeks after they had 8,000 people in one day. So are you, what's the decompression? Is it for people who've already gone through the CBP process? What's the... What's yeah, it could be a little bit of the above. So, like, if, if Arizona is seeing surges, as an example, and they're getting overrun, they just don't have the capacity there to deal with that, we may, may, may help with CBP and move those individuals through decompression maybe into Texas or, you know, other parts of the border. So back and forth and move individuals around the different detention centers or areas where we can have more, ca more capacity to deal with the numbers. Okay, and I imagine as, the, as these numbers uh, increased in the last fiscal year, uh, of people who are, you know, need to be processed. That's the reason why these flights, I guess, have gone up. I, I imagine is that right? That's the correct. decompression. Okay. That's correct. Last um, brief uh, period of time I have, I'm going to discuss a problem in Maryland uh, because uh, there are counties in Maryland, like Montgomery County, just to the north of here, where the county executive strangely claims that they are not a sanctuary county, but according to a story of February 28th, uh, ICE has issued 119 detainers in fiscal year 2024 in the county, and ICE says none of those have been honored. Is that true to the best of your knowledge? In Montgomery County, Maryland, ICE has correctly issued 119 detainers, and none have been honored as of February? That specifically, I don't know. I will have to get If you could get, get back, back to me and confirm whether that's true or not, because you know, I re I'm reading in a press report, and goodness knows, you can't always trust a press report, but uh, that being said, uh, there were two fairly high-profile cases in Montgomery County where detainers were issued, uh, where in one case the, uh, the detainee was subsequently arrested uh, for uh, being part of a murder of a two-year-old, as I recall, uh, and then another one, uh, another one with another uh, violent crime. And fortunately, because I, I just looked at the ICE website, I think uh, uh, it might even be today or yesterday. There was, there was a press release about how uh, ICE has, in fact, despite the best efforts of Montgomery County to uh, let this person uh, uh, prey upon Marylanders, uh, ICE has uh, arrested that Salvadoran and detained them. So congratulations for doing it, despite the best efforts of some of our, uh, uh, and I put in air quotes, leaders in Maryland who continue to uh, make uh, these jurisdictions, who brag about these jurisdictions as sanctuary jurisdictions, uh, and turn a blind eye to the crime problem that you and your uh, agency are trying to solve. So thank you very much for your service. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Ohio for five minutes. The floor is yours. We'll, we'll call ourselves Iowegians today. That sounds great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you, Acting Director Leitner, Leitner for appearing before us today. Um, I want to just start off by kind of echoing some of my colleagues' comments. I think it's um, disappointing to see President Biden and Secretary Mayorkas asking again for the um, contingency, we call it slush fund, um, again this year. I thought we made it pretty clear 
um, in our fiscal year 24 uh, appropriations process that um, we do not see this as a, a feasible solution to addressing surges at the border. I mean, uh, you talk about the beds and um, your assur assurance is there, but um, does it take some time to prop up these beds? I mean, you can't just uh, snap your fingers and have beds ready to go to handle a surge of migrants at the southern border. I mean, you're talking about flying them um, from state to state at a huge taxpayer expense. Uh, how quickly can you turn these beds around when you have a surge situation? Well, we have a certain number of, uh, you know, government, you know, minimum beds. So the GM, we call GM beds where we all, we're paying for a certain amount we have all the time. And right now our utilization of those beds is about 85%. Uh, but it's the extra beds where we get, that's, we're talking about the surge beds, if you will. Um, and um, I'm, I'm less, I would like to have uh, more money dedicated and appropriated for the beds personally, but I... So you'd rather have the beds in your bottom line rather than have to rely on this surge funding? Personally, yes. Okay. That's, that's important to know. And I heard you mention that 50,000 number. Is that where you'd like that number to really be? Yes, we think that that's more appropriate. Okay. Um, I want to follow up on um, uh, something my colleague, Mr. Harris, just mentioned. You mentioned, um, or he brought up specifically the challenges in enforcement at the local level in Maryland. Um, and I know that's something you face around the country. Many of the jurisdictions that uh, you mentioned earlier, Florida, Illinois, New York, I I'm sure New York, Illinois, I can see here, probably New Jersey, Baltimore, um, are, are some of the places that you face many of the challenges in enforcement. Um, so how do uh, sanctuary cities impact your enforcement and efforts um, when they're re refusing to cooperate at the local level of those jurisdictions? How are you uh, working to ensure the safety and security of um, those communities while still working to apprehend these violent criminals? Yes, good question. Thank you, ma'am. Listen, um, I, as you know, I'm a career police officer. This is what, what I've done for my whole career. And I will always work and engage and have dialogue with state and local partners. That's where I started. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to work together and we want to protect public safety and national security. And in those jurisdictions where they're prohibited from dealing with us, we're going to have to do it ourselves and have to do a more, uh, a lot of at large or in the communities, uh, fugitive operations, if you will. Uh, and those are much more time consuming, resource draining and dangerous. But we do them because we have to upload the law, uphold the law and it's public safety, national security. We'd much prefer to have a good dialogue and have assistance from our state and local uh, partners. But regardless, we're going to we're going to execute our mission and uphold the law. Do you know how many detainers you've issued that you have not had cooperation or response with nationwide? Uh, not off the top of my head, but I will get you that. Okay, I would appreciate the breakdown there. Um, and then you mentioned the ability to work with local law enforcement, and I, I certainly appreciate that, and thank you for the work you've done to keep uh, your communities, and I, I work directly with our local law enforcement all the time. They're great out on the front lines, um, but we know um, they're they facing uphill battles um, in our communities too. So um, is there strong uh, coordination in those instances? How, how do you develop those relationships and work around some of these sanctuary cities? Yes, so we do generally, we can work. It's uh, on civil immigration, it's, it's, it can be very problematic depending on the jurisdiction we're dealing with. Um, and we do the best we can to work with them. And my guidance to our personnel is do not let the perfect be the enemy of the good and find a way to work with state and local counterparts wherever we can. And as it relates to, uh, you know, criminality and investigations that are beyond the scope of the civil immigration, um, we've had much more success in these jurisdictions. And, uh, the, you know, quite frankly, I'm very pleased with the amount of uh, cooperation and relationships we have in that venue, okay. specifically well, for HSI. Yeah, and if you would follow up, I appreciate you following up with that information on the, um, the detainers um, nationwide. Um, how are you working to um, use HSI agents to um, better keep track of individuals that have committed crimes in communities um, I, and make sure that they're being apprehended? I think there's a, a growing frustration from people watching um, people who are here illegally commit crimes, even assaulting law enforcement officers and being released into our communities. Um, I think crime of all levels should be considered a removable offense. Um, so um, is that a barrier, you know, in terms of um, sanctuary cities placing the protections on those individuals? Is it um, prosecutors not prosecuting? What in your mind is the problem here that we need to be addressing? Well, that would fall under our ERO side of the house and the fugitive operations going after criminal aliens, as we know. Uh, so we've gotten some more, more, more money in the 25 budget as, as a request, so that'll help a little bit. We have some fugitive operations money in there and some criminal apprehension programs, so that's going out and getting these criminals. And that's where we're trying to partner more and more we can with state and locals and do what we can to pull as many of these individuals into custody. All right. Well, I see my time has expired. Thank you, Acting Director. I yield back, Mr. Thank Chair. You, Thank you. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for questions. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman. 
and thank you for being here and thank you for the work that you are doing to, to protect our country. Um, do, how many how many migrants are you monitoring? Is ICE monitoring at the time being? Um, so the whole population. Yeah. So we're you know we have about thirty five uh, thousand today. We have about thirty five thousand approximately in custody. Uh, we have about give or take 190,000 on alternatives to detention, and that's a subset of the non-detained, which is over 7 million. Okay, and how many, uh, how many migrants have a criminal record that are in our country at the moment? Um, I'll take that as a get-back. I don't know exactly how many have off the top of my head. We have a number that's over 300,000. That, that, that comports correctly that, of, the, of the non-detained. Uh, what steps does ICE take to verify whether migrants have a uh, criminal record or not? There's a couple steps. So when, uh, if these individuals are encountered at the border or at the port of entry, CBP would do a check on them and run, and run the check and, and see if there's any record there. Within about 72 hours, they're going to be turned over to uh, ICE custody for determination on detention or non-detained status or alternatives to detention. And then we run a second check at that point to make sure that we just double check to make sure whatever criminality exists. Uh, in many cases, you know, you know, there's going to be nothing. And in some cases, the criminality would actually pop up later on where we, we weren't aware of it at the given time. Well, and well, first of all, by criminal activity, we're, we're excluding actually crossing the border legally. But, uh, That's correct, yes. <laughs> but uh, 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 so when they come to the border, they're in CB, uh, CBP custody. Um, many of them are not presenting identification where it's kind of we're taking their word for it. Obviously, someone who has a criminal history is not likely to show documentation. Uh, how is ICE dealing with this? Does ICE ha have the capability to deal with this? So we, we, we use any, any and all information we have at the time. Uh, I can't speak for CBP's uh, method of vetting and screening. Right. But However, you're basically confirming CBP's data. We're doing we're, our own double. We're just double checking on, on everything. And we do our own. It's separate. Okay. But, uh, and then we're doing biometrics. We're doing everything we can to determine, um, you know, what we can. So on if the we know there's 300,000 criminal aliens, it's, it's likely substantially higher. I mean, I've been, been down at the border. A lot of them drop their IDs at the border. Uh, don't bring them across. You know, you look at them when they're vetting uh, the process. You know, they ask them their name. They ask them how old they are. They ask, right, but but they're just taking their word for it. Right? And a lot of the criminal aliens that are referenced in that that, that number in the non-detained, a lot of those individuals, uh, you know, they committed some kind of criminal act while they were here as well. That it was mm -hmm. after the fact that they were encountered. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wanted to bring up 287G. Uh, a, a lot's been said about that today already, but 10 of my 14 counties are part of the program. Uh, others would like to, to join, but we've seen that the Biden administration has put a, a, a pause in new applications. I, I'm just curious as to why. You, you admit that it's a, a valuable tool. Uh, a number of the law enforcement organizations throughout certainly South Texas would love to be a part. And uh, any reason why this is a congressionally mandated program? Uh, and yeah, I, I, I can't answer for the Biden ignored. administration, honestly. I can say that a well-run, properly overseen program is effective and a good tool that we have to work with our state and local partners. It's not the only tool, but it's it's a good tool, and uh, I found it to be effective. Um, it, it, we're looking at the budget, and so FY 2018, uh, the, the agency budget was about $7.4 billion. Uh, the agency removed 256800 five illegal aliens. Uh, we look at FY22, the, the budget was over a billion higher, uh, 72,177 illegal aliens were removed. I realize that's not the only thing that you're doing, but there's not necessarily a direct correlation, but certainly a correlation between increased budget and less uh, uh, illegal alien removal. Um, can you square that for us and, and tell us what's going on there? Yes. Well, uh for, for quite a while, from COVID up until uh, May of 23, we were also conducting Title 42 operations where uh, those people were being expelled. So the actual removal numbers don't count all of the expulsions that were in there as well. So when you combine those numbers, it's it's higher than uh, than just the removal numbers. Okay, but the last years are not certainly not what they were five years ago. No, the, the, yes, they're lower. 
Uh, okay. Um, one more question, and this has to do with Endeavors contracting. Uh, I believe you, you know Endeavors. Uh, I do, sir. No bid contract, $80 million uh, made by basically an Obama transition team official, left, went to be on the board for Endeavors. Uh, not only was it a non no bid contract, it was an unsolicited contract, uh, and, and then that basically was repeated with HHS. Uh, can you t talk to us about what you're doing? And then you know we can get into what happened with that contract. You know, there's been reports about how how that money was spent was very wasteful. Hotel rooms that were never used and the like. Um, a lot of mismanagement going on here, and certainly a lot of circumspect on how these contracts are being awarded. Uh, could you speak to what you're doing to clean up uh, yeah. the no-bid contract processing? So uh, regarding that, uh, we, we did a review, and all appropriate career folks that were in acquisition and, and in, in the process had eyes on that. Uh, we That's not sufficient for me to say that there was no impropriety. No, 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 sir. I'm, I'm saying that we're looking at everything to make sure there's no... There, there's, there, there's nothing that could be even perceived to be in, improper. Uh, the individual that, you know, there was a memo that was written about who was going to have oversight and what kind of policy and procedure we're going to have within the agency. Uh, that was corrected and changed. Uh, and we have full, uh, full oversight on how we're doing this internally. I'd be happy to follow up uh, offline and, and get you our policies and procedures as it relates to that. Thank you. Appreciate it. The gentleman from Mississippi, uh, Mr. Guest, is recognized. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director, uh, thank you uh, for coming in earlier this week, uh, visiting with me and my staff uh, in preparation uh, for the hearing. Uh, I'm going to ask you some of the questions that we spoke of when you were in the office. And uh, first, and I know that uh, Ms. Henson mentioned it earlier, uh, detention beds. Uh, we know that currently under the FY24 budget that Congress has appropriated funding for 41,500 detention beds. Um, the um, secretary uh, was testifying uh, last week uh, before this very committee. Uh, he testified in, um, before us that uh, he felt like the Senate request of 50,000 beds uh, that was in uh, the negotiations uh, in the Senate, uh, that he supported a 50,000 bed um, request. Um, in our conversation that we had, and not trying to mischaracterize that, I believe that you said you would also support a 50,000 bed request, uh, but the request that we've received from Congress is not a 50,000 bed request, which would have been an increase from FY24, but it's actually a substantial decrease of 7,500 beds to 34,000. Um, and so is it safe to say that a 34,000 bed request would be insufficient to meet the needs of your agency? And, and I want to look at that in relation to something else we talked about, which is the non-detention document. Uh, in your annual report, uh, ICE annual report that you and I went over a little bit, we talked about the fact that uh, at the end of FY23, uh, that the non-detained docket uh, had... Uh, uh, approach roughly 6.2 million uh, individuals who were in the country. During our conversation, you both said you believe now that that number has grown to more than 7 million. Uh, and I've read media reports that by the end of FY24, uh, so in roughly six months from now, uh, that number will top 8 million. And so at a time in which we have a record flow of immigrants coming across the border, where we now have a record number of individuals who were on the non-detention document who are going to now uh, very quickly reach over 8 million, uh, and also at a time in which we've seen media reports uh, involving individuals who are not in the country legally uh, committing violent crime. Um, is a $34,000, excuse me, a 34,000 bed number uh, is that sufficient to meet the needs of your agency? Thank you, sir. Yes, I, and thank you for meeting earlier in the week as well. Um, I, too, would support the 50000 as the secretary uh, stated. Um, and 
we are comfortable with the 34 because of the contingency fund that they've promised me have available. I, and, and, I, let, let's, and let me just, if Congress refuses to support the contingency fund, which is what I believe that this body will not do, um, again, uh, looking at the powers uh, of the Constitution and power of the purse being related to the Constitution, uh, we as a body, many of us at least, are very reluctant uh, to give any administrative agency, uh, regardless of who's in charge, uh, access to billions of dollars in contingency funds. And so if we are not going to fund the contingency uh, fund and we are only and you're going to be limited to the number of beds that have been requested, is thirty four thousand dollars, excuse me, I don't know why thirty four thousand beds is that sufficient? No, uh, if, if there's no contingency fund and there's no room, uh, for surge in case of uh, capacity need. No, I would not be comfortable with it without that. Okay. And then uh, one of the other things we talked about a little bit, and it's also in your report, is uh, detainers. Uh, and, and in your report it says detainers, uh, and I, I say your report, the report issued by your agency, it says detainers are critical public safety tools because they allow ICE to focus enforcement resources on removable non-citizens who have been arrested for criminal activity as part of the agency's discretionary authority. Uh, and we talked about the fact there are certain jurisdictions, uh, both local and state jurisdictions, which refuse to cooperate with ICE. They refuse to honor detainers. So we have individuals who are first in the country legally, they're in the country illegally, and then they commit crimes. And in many cases, they're ultimately convicted of those crimes. Uh, but then we have agencies that refuse to cooperate. So talk about the impediment that that creates for your agency uh, to remove those individuals. Uh, talk about the additional manpower and expenses, because once those indiv individuals are released and the detainer is not honored, uh, then agents working under your direction are having to put themselves in harm's way, go locate those individuals, arrest those individuals, and put them into deportation. Uh, and so talk a little bit uh, about uh, the frustration you have with agencies that don't honor uh, those detainers and what, if anything, should Congress do? Uh, should Congress refuse just to ignore that and to allow uh, these agencies to suffer no penalties or should Congress seek to maybe withhold federal funding uh, to try to require these agencies to comply with lawful federal detainers? Uh, and so with that, uh, Mr. D Director, I'll give you the floor. All right, thank you. Yes, I, I, as I stated before, we need to collaborate with our state and local uh, partners as much as possible. And you said, how does it affect our operations? Well, it makes it much more difficult when they do not uh, cooperate and collaborate with us. Anytime we have to do an at-large arrest, which is sending our fugitive operations teams out into the, into the general public and communities to grab these individuals, it's inherently more unsafe. I said that as, at a press conference a few months ago for one of our operations. It costs a lot more money. It puts our people and uh, the, you know, the, the local uh, citizenry in, in harm's way, potentially, when we're out there and doing that. So I, I hope to collaborate with state and locals wherever possible. In some places, it's great. Other places, it's okay. In some places, it's bad. But I would like to do it as much as possible wherever we can, and I would like to I would like everyone to cooperate on law enforcement, public safety, national security matters. And do you feel that Congress should weigh in for those agencies that refuse to cooperate? I would like anyone to weigh in that could help. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Lechleitner, thank you for coming today. Uh, appreciate the, the candor of, of your testimony. Members are reminded that they can submit any additional questions for the record. And we ask that you respond in a time, timely manner I'll give you the thumbnail sketch, which may fall under incredibly naive or um, well-informed, uh, uh, allows us to schedule all of our actions accordingly. Uh, our last hearing is May 1st, and so we plan on working in the month of May towards a committee markup, so we'll be drafting legislation in May as a result of these hearings, that sort of thing. I tell you that, one, so you know generally, and two, so that if there are member questions submitted as follow-up, that you endeavor to be timely in that, as well as if you need clarification for anything in that time frame, we will endeavor to make sure you have the information you need. And so uh, with that, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you, sir. Thank you.